Yeah. Let's get started. Uh, my name is Brian Gillis. I teach in the art department here in the ceramics area. Um, and this is a really exciting lecture for me. Um, I wanted to start by thanking you guys for coming and um, thanking Paul and the generosity of the um, Department of Art and the Bob James Ceramics Foundation. Um, like I said, this is a special thing for me. In the last couple of years, um, Paul and I have gotten to know each other a little bit, and, um, and he's a really wonderful person that I just can't get enough of. Um, I first met Paul about 10 years ago when he was teaching a non-traditional ceramics class at the Art Institute of Chicago. And I'm happy to say that that class no longer exists at the Art Institute. And uh, really, because of Paul and a lot of other people, there's really no place for it in any curriculum at this point. Um, and uh, <laughs> Paul has been extraordinarily active within the discipline as somebody uh, who both champion and champions and challenges the discipline, which is thousands of years old and has a lot of stakeholders um, that don't want to be challenged. Um, he's done so as a teacher, um, as an author, as a panelist, as a moderator, as an organizer, um, as an administrator, and as an artist. Um, Though I do respect him deeply as a man, and um, I respect his work within the field, I think the thing that I'm, uh, I most respect and I'm, I'm most taken by is his work. Um, uh, the fact, uh, in fact, the very thing that I think makes him so great as a colleague um, and somebody within the discipline, I think also carries over into what makes his work so, so wonderful. Uh, the degrees to which he uses his practice as research to better kind of understand the systems that uh, we all are a part of um, is uh, pretty extraordinary. Uh, he approaches such complex things that necessitate so many different considerations with a really poetic objectivity that I think is special. Um, as it, it really can't help but draw out relevant connections to things that are outside of the work, things that um, might not be at hand at that point. Um, so I'm really excited to hear Paul's talk uh, toward models, propositions, and possible systems. Um, Paul is an associate professor at uh, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, he's shown nationally and internationally in galleries and museums, most recently at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, he has spoken at conferences and institutions throughout uh, the U.S. and abroad. Um, and I'm really grateful to have you here. So um, please help me uh, welcome Paul Sakharou. Can you hear me? <clears throat> is this enough? Am I? Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Well, um, thanks for that lovely introduction, Brian. And. Uh, you know, one of the nicest things about working in this field, and I guess particularly the field of ceramics, because that's the one I'm coming from, uh, is that you get to know people. And as you get to know people as artists, and then you get to know them professionally, and then sometimes you have friendships grow out of it, and then you get to see where they work, live, and teach, and then there gets to be this great dialogue that I think happens across people. And there's times where that happens really consciously, and there's other times where um, I think a number of us are involved in conversations with each other through what we do and what we make. And uh, so Brian's one of those people that I was particularly glad to get to meet and know a bit, partially because his work really perplexed me and challenged, was challenging to look at and think about. So I really enjoyed um, the conversation that we've been able to start having. That's me. Um, so before I start the serious part of the talk, um, these are my children, and um, I, I'm, I've started to feel, as my children have gotten a little bit older, that it's um, kind of possible for me to present a kind of talk about what I do without the acknowledgement that this is a huge part of what I do as well um, as a parent. So um, they're prone to great, um, well, what you're looking at here, incredible theatrics that take the form of these costumes. Uh, so being a parent is a, is a huge part of, of my work uh, in a kind of non-expected way, I suppose. It's, it's, it's one of the things that I juggle. So as a sculptor, 
Well, actually, let me back up for one moment before I, I, I say this, is um, a bit of my background, because I think it's significant for me in terms of educationally where I've come from and the way in which that's affected me. Um, Brian mentioned that I taught the non-traditional class that he took. To this day, I can barely remember Brian in that class. <laughs> and when I met him, I thought, no, that, I don't think so. And, and over the years, like I keep staring at his face, like, oh, right. And it was the first class I taught. And to say I was scared was an understatement. Like I was terrified of that class. And um, it was a great experience. And I went to school uh, originally as an undergraduate at the School for American Crafts, which was at the Rochester Institute of Technology in upstate New York. And I grew up outside of New York City. So going to school upstate, as you say, was kind of uh, this logical thing to do. And RIT was one of the last, at the time, really kind of one of the last craft schools of its kind in existence. So as a freshman, you entered declaring a major, and you worked for uh, three full days a week, eight hours a day in that studio. And then you took, quote, extra classes. So we took craft drawing, and the art students took drawing. We took craft design, they took design. So there was this clear sense that like we were crafts people, and then there were the art students. And I had an image of what my life would look like when I was 19, and it involved like having a wood kiln and living in Vermont, and I was going to be a potter. Like I had this whole like really beautiful mythology around what that was going to be, and it's a great life, but it's absolutely not the one I've ended up living. And after three years in the craft school, I felt that there was an incompatibility that the things I was interested in asking questions about didn't sync up with the logic of what this craft school was about um, philosophically. And I left and took a little time off, and then I went to Alfred University as an undergraduate for two years. And that was a really great shift, because here I was in a ceramics department in a fairly integrated art school. So now I was one of a whole bunch of kids in a whole bunch of disciplines who were all in art school, rather than being the craft school in this other area. And as a grad student, I ended up going to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in ceramics, but no one in ceramics used clay at the time. Like, if you were in ceramics, you used video. If you were in painting, you used ceramics. And if you were in ceramics and used ceramics, you were seen as kind of archaic. It was like really unhip to use your material, but it was very hip to use somebody else's. And it was an interesting place to be in that you didn't have an identity as a media-specific artist. And at the time, and this was in the late 90s, 94, 96, um, there was a whole politics. Politics were a huge issue, and people were talking about the role of an artist as a cultural producer, and you know, the idea of the artist as an engaged member of society, and having a critical practice. And these were like huge discussions at the time. And those three experiences have had huge impacts on how I approach my work, and also how I approach so as a sculptor, I've chosen to work uh, in a number of materials over the years, ceramics, plaster, cast resin, wood. And these materials have all been selected very specifically for their ability to operate and reference specific uh, practices, ideologies, and histories. So when I choose to use something, I have tried to choose it for a specific reason, rather than just choosing it because that's what I use or that's what I do. And yet, even within these frameworks and discrete projects, I find myself continually pulled back to the material of ceramics. And I'm fascinated by all that it can do in the ways it's taken on such historical importance while simultaneously being so easily missed. And in this regard, I've thought that it's both too large and too small to be seen. It's locked away in our cupboards. It's used on a daily basis. And I can think of fewer materials so capable of slipping into our daily lives. These are not things that I've made. These were images from Martha Stewart living on this great spread about decorative ceramics. Hmm. Hmm. Sorry, we're stuck. Let's go somewhere. There we go. And I'm fascinated with the materiality of ceramics, its ability to operate in extremes. Extremes of scale, function, application. At times it's poetic, at other times it can be quite preposterous. And it's capable of the most extraordinary things through its inherent ability to mimic other surfaces. And through the application of a paper-thin layer of glaze, shifts can suddenly occur that point toward marble, granite, or more quote-unquote substantial things. And in its raw state, the material lacks any predetermined form. It has no scale. It has only mass. 
These are images from Gladding McBee and Company that was a producer of architectural terracotta. And ceramics has always had a direct relationship to the built environment through its use of cladding, a covering over brick and wooden structures that somehow communicate in public more private aspirations of its planners and inhabitants. And in this regard, ceramics can be thought of in its broadest possible terms, for me, as a practice that is inherently linked to the act of urban planning and ultimately ornamentation. The Shakers made wonderfully elaborate drawings of planned utopian communities that are full of amazing shifts in both scale and perspective. There's something incredibly compelling in looking at the way architecture is situated in these drawings and plans. And the documents present a rare moment of understanding something in a way that is impossible when you actually inhabit the space, walk through the site, and live within the community. And this is not to say that one takes priority over the other, but rather points at the inevitable gap between envisioning something and experiencing it. And such practices always walk a fine line between the pragmatic and the fantastical. In many instances, the act of imagining an architectural structure can embody possibilities that far exceed a pre-described function. In such fantastical worlds, the notion of a use value is pushed to seemingly absurd limits. The plan is no longer simply intended to be built, but rather operates in far more complex ways. It's the complexity of planning such impossible projects that I'm so drawn to as an artist. As in this drawing, which depicts both the plan and notation for Ebenezer Howard's Garden City, which was a wonderfully utopian and as such highly problematic proposal to social and environmental ills of 19th century London. And here you can see in the schematic the kind of absurd, hopeful, and prescribed way that Howard envisioned town operating. And Howard envisioned a plan that would link communities, architecture, and economies with the then open green spaces of the countryside, which a seemingly straightforward notion that was articulated through a complex series of plans and grand proclamations. In retrospect, this and other such projects of the time seem to exist in a constant state of potentiality. The very potential of such spaces becomes articulated through drawings and models. And as such, the envisioned city becomes a space as ornamental as the garden itself. As an artist, I try to, or I strive rather, to make wide reaching connections that reconsider these and other such plans through a broad frame of reference. And this activity of looking and research is central to my studio practice and informs the formal, conceptual, and ultimately sculptural decisions that I make. Over the past 10 years, I've produced a diverse body of work that ranges from large-scale installations to publicly cited works and discrete objects. My practice has been best described as project-based, with individual projects and works falling under a variety of self-defined categories. And these projects are often long-term ones, and more often than not, overlap one another. So there will be many times where I'll work on work, shift projects, and then return to much of the installation work that I have done has been produced collaboratively, as in this piece, Labyrinth, that was made with Robert Lentz and commissioned through the John Michael Kohler Art Center, which, being that we're not in the Midwest, uh, is in Wisconsin. And strategies of collaborative work have allowed me great freedom. And in the most pragmatic way, it allows for overly ambitious and sometimes foolhardy decisions to be rushed into with the illusion of great But in a much more serious way, it allows for ideas to be collided in ways that might never happen through a more solitary practice. The activity of planning, writing project proposals and budgets, and ultimately building on site, each provide moments to broaden the scope of how one thinks about their work. And this piece, Labyrinth, was 40 feet wide and constructed from standard building materials, two by fours, drywall, et cetera. 
There were two viewing platforms that flanked either side of the entryway and provided an elevated view into the structure. The work itself utilized the strategy of minimalism as a means of overlaying a variety of sources from ornamental landscapes to panoptic prisms. From a specific vantage point, the piece is reduced to a continuous horizon line, and from another, a bird's eye view of pathways. <clears throat> the work existed for a set length of time, after which it was demolished. And I would add that these works are not site-specific in that they do not necessarily correspond to the history of their respective sites, but rather I think of them as site responsive in how the work considers the particularities of the individual spaces. And for me, these are very important distinctions. Working with Jennifer Lapham, this next piece yonder took on our respective interest in landscape, architecture, and the decorative arts. <clears throat> the project consisted of a 30-foot oval room Slipcast ceramic birds, a 14 foot wall drawing, miniature landscapes. <clears throat> Quite literally, the word yonder refers to a place that is perpetually not here but elsewhere, just out of reach but still discernible. The individual parts of this piece all point toward a dialogue on the construction of landscape, nature, and place. Genres such as decorative wallpaper literally weave images of the outside, quote, natural world into the spaces of our daily lives. The distant is brought closer and the natural becomes simulated, and in this regard, perhaps more real than the thing itself. A 16-foot wall drawing, which was a projection of a paint-by-number landscape, echoed the scale and form of the oval structure. In its large scale, the image flipped back and forth between something understandable and complete abstraction when you stood right in front of it. These collaborative projects occupy an important part of my production and one that I return to intermittently and when they seem appropriate. Outside of collaborative work, my individual studio practice has indeed remained my central activity with the act of research now serving a somewhat collaborative role. And this method of research that I'm engaged in might best be considered a, a wandering one. And the cultural historian Walter Benjamin writes of the flaneur, which is the, the wandering pedestrian who comprises a complex history of space, place, and time through shop windows of the arcade. So by standing in front of the window, one would imagine kind of being in another place or another context. And ultimately, the, the, the sense of place in the city that Benjamin describes happens through this kind of accidental wandering. So upon moving to Chicago in the early 90s, and I'm leaving out a lot of what came before that point, part of which, by the way, involved living on a sheep farm, which was just before I moved to Chicago, uh, I became obsessed with how the city was reimagined in the early 19th century. And again, such curiosities are not always intentional, and I also don't believe they're always clearly understood. And I think that we all get fixated on things as artists, and that we additionally have the added luxury of translating those notions and curiosities into something else, and sometimes if you're lucky, you can even get paid for it. And one such fixation of mine, upon moving to Chicago, looking at the city and wondering how, why it looked the way it did, became the Chicago 1893 World's Fair, which was also known as the Columbian Exposition. And I became obsessed with this fair, and I began reading every book I could find on the fair. I was going to, you know, historical societies, and then I was retracing the steps through Chicago to visit a site where the fair used to be for no particular reason except to think how bizarre that, that was. And the fair itself was designed by Daniel Burnham with Frederick Law Olmsted as the landscape architect. And Burnham then went on to become the chief planner for Chicago after the Chicago fire when the city burned down, and Olmsted, uh, of course, goes on to to great recognition, probably most prominently for designing Central Park in New York. And the fair at the time was unprecedented in, in both scale and grandeur. So this is actually in Chicago. Within the context of the fair existed something called the White City, which was Burnham's highly problematic model city, whose sense of spectacle was achieved through the image of ornate and decadent buildings 
whose exteriors were coated in plaster and jute, a kind of straw product added to the plaster, not traditional terracotta. So in short, these were elaborate stage sets, European in design, but distinctly American in their absurd placement within the Midwest. There was nothing in many of these buildings. Some of them served as exhibition halls when they were finished, but a lot of them were literally sheds with this ornate uh, covering on the outside. And everything at the fair was slightly oversized, just too big, not quite right. And the fair had one single photographer, which was a man by the name of C.D. Arnold. And Arnold was charged with the task of documenting the exposition through view books and historical records. He was, to note, the only photographer that was allowed to take photographs of the fair. The only others that were allowed to were sort of pedestrian tours. No one else was allowed to produce an actual document except for Arnold. And the Art Institute of Chicago has the original photographs, which are really nice. The reason that I think this is important is it's significant to note the way that through Arnold's photography at the incredibly heavy-handed direction of Burnham, that views are eclipsed. And what ends up happening is that the actual city that lay in the relatively near distance, which is on the south side of Chicago, is now absent. So this could be anywhere. And in Arnold's documentation, the fair stands as a single entity removed from the reality of day-to-day -day life. A reality, by the way, that was quite ugly at the time, right? This is when cities are full of coal. People are dying of black lung. When Pittsburgh is so dirty during the day that from cold that people can't see. And Chicago was a you know, a, a, you know uh, butchering capital of the Midwest, right? This is like it's an ugly time in the city. It's not looking good, right? It's growing fast and it's really dirty. It didn't look lovely. And Arnold titled this image Windmills of the World, which I suppose no self-respecting fair would be complete without such a massive display of wind power. Right? So this is like all the windmills of the world put on the edge of Lake Michigan for you to see. And it's precisely for me this combination of the serious and problematic placed next to something so utterly absurd as this that I'm drawn to it looking at the fair. And over the past number of years, and I would say more than that, really, this sort of collision has had a great impact on the sculptural logic of my work, not just on the content of what I want to make work about, but literally on the, the logic upon which I try to approach the act of making sculpture. And probably nowhere is it more illustrated than in this beautifully absurd object, which is a tower of oranges, of course. And it was intended just to display, essentially, the prowess of the Florida orange grower. So this whole thing is built of oranges. And I suppose that one could make sculpture out of images of the fair for like forever. Could you make an object that cool, like out of oranges? Probably not. And for me, making sculpture is a way to flesh out this often strange and curious historical moment that I'm so particularly drawn to. And these histories have come to comprise both a critical underpinning for much of my work, as well as a certain aesthetic strategy that I've tried to deploy. And I'd add that my work is not attempting to illustrate this history or any other per se, but rather to use it as a springboard. And this is something that I struggled with for quite some time. And it was a question that was continually waged against my work. Is this an attempt to illustrate a history? What is it? What are you doing? It's incredibly annoying, but very valid. And this is the piece, really, that began that, that questioning. And I, I had a job over a summer where I, I worked at a public art program in the city where I worked with high school kids. And it was right across from this building that had these decadent laurel wreaths at the top. And I spent many a hot afternoon kind of spacing out when it was too hot, staring at these laurel wreaths and thinking, what are those things? And like, why are they on this building? And what that led to was the very base kind of experience that the only way I could understand it was to make it. And it was completely irrational. There wasn't a big reason behind it. I just decided I had to remake this thing. And that's what I did. So this piece, Welcome, which is seen in this in the following frame, it borrowed the image of Laurel Reef, as would be commonly found in facades of public buildings. 
And I spent a great deal of time, as I said, both looking at the object on site where I was working, but I also began circling around the city noting other instances where the laurel wreath would be found, which all led to this overwhelming desire to make it. And this is generally where my work starts, and I'm certainly not saying that it's always a good thing, but it starts with this kind of irrational desire to remake something. And then I spend months trying to figure out what this quote thing is really about and why I'm so compelled to make it. But setting up the system of making it provides some pretty wonderful moments for me as an artist and also provides a labor activity through which to understand something, hopefully in more substantial terms. And the wreath was made in terracotta and ultimately when finished was sited in an abandoned lot where the work became a sketch for a park. And dotting the length of the site were seven custom designed concrete pillars that each held a ceramic tile with a letter embossed in relief. The word welcome was written into the landscape, dotted across these uh, pillars, and the wreath lay directly on the ground. And the piece operated in ways that my work had never done before, because when put out into this site, it became a reference point in the neighborhood. It was a spot to walk your dog, to direct someone toward, to sit on, or at one point to hide drugs under. And all of these things took place in and around the site, and it was very much outside of my prior assumption of what this work was or how it might function. And essentially, when placed in this context, it was no longer mine. And other people took ownership of it. And through that experience, I, I began to really think carefully about what the role of ornament might be within the city and the way that it generally was placed on very major architectural structures that were predominantly large in scale. The ornament was removed from the ground and it was generally mounted high above reach. And after the, that wreath was situated, the woman who lived next door in, in this house, she very practically asked me where I had purchased it, assuming she would go and buy one, because she liked it. And I really like proudly as you know, a young artist that I made this, to which she could care less. She wasn't impressed. She wasn't, there was nothing. She just said, oh, could I have one too? Like I'd go back to my little wreath factory and I would make one. And it was really interesting. Like, she didn't care that I made it. It wasn't about that, but she wanted one, and she thought it was really beautiful. And I told her that I couldn't, didn't have another one on hand, but that I would like to make something for her house, to which she said that would be fine. So uh, this woman had this amazing business running out of her house where she collected old bread from bakeries, and by, like, the massive garbage bag load, it would be in her house, and then local... Um, kids and people from the neighborhood, it was a fairly low or economy neighborhood, would come and get this bread from her. So it served as this like distribution point for food out of her house. So I decided to make her this very small, what I considered a little minor ornament that uh, would be intentionally small, seemingly unimportant, but kind of slightly odd that could kind of mark her, her home as, as this site. And she loved it. And at the t which led her to ask if she could have another. And so I made one more to, to kind of mark the alley, which was a place where people were scrapping metal. So the alley, this was behind her house, and there were trucks that would drive up and down picking up scrap copper and, and things like this to sell. So suddenly I started thinking about the way in which sites operate in all these complex ways, and that one would never ornament the back of the building, but we would ornament the front of where you kind of enter the bank. And I thought, well, this is kind of the bank of sorts, right? There's this whole other economy happening home. And I realized that was the end of our working together because I think it could have gone on endlessly for me to keep making work for her home. But it was a really interesting experience to think about kind of marking the, these spots. And these early works were made in cast concrete and it's a material that I see as having great similarity to ceramic and its potential to be cast. And it also for me suggests a certain language of civic ornament and in this regard carries a, a sense of authority and function just through its materiality. And at the time, people would often ask where the work was located, and I, of course, would tell them, and they would drive by and come back to me and comment they couldn't find it, but they would never actually stop and get out of their car. And in many ways, I like this aspect of it, that the work became invisible unless you knew where it was and unless you lived in that place and um, had a connection to that, that location which ultimately raised some pretty serious questions for me about the role of our work as makers, the function of a given piece and the assumed audience that we make work for. 
And over time, I began to look at certain histories of, quote, applied ornaments. And I came across this, this notion of stock ornament. And this is an ad for the American Terracotta Company, Instagram company that uh, was in Illinois. And there were many of these uh, companies scattered around the US. And they, unfortunately, the terracotta industry in the United States died out at a certain point. But these places would produce ornament. And uh, one could purchase what was called stock ornament. So if you were an architect building a small building, you could go buy a little piece of ornament. And you could put it on your place. And this notion of stock ornament was really championed by the American architect and designer Louis Sullivan. And Sullivan had a really tragic life. Uh, he, he was you know, a major American architect. Uh, he was the runner up to design the Chicago Fair. Burnham beat him out. And, uh, in the end of his life, he died penniless and alcoholic. And it was, it's this tragically sad story. But he had this really intense belief that the thing that was going to save society was ornamentation. And he, and he designed ornament that was specifically based on the language of growth and seeds and seed pods that, that grew and split and multiplied, et cetera. And he believed that, that, uh, uh, that a, a culture and a town and a city and a place surrounded by ornament would ultimately add to the dose. Of a beautiful failed project. And Sullivan became a lead proponent of this stock ornament and designed much of it uh, that was then sold by places like American Terracotta. And so, in thinking about some of those histories, and, and again, in thinking about kind of the impossibility and problematics of them, uh, I proposed this project called Minor Ornament. And the project was done twice and commissioned by two small towns. And what I did was I, I selected sites in these towns that were conspicuously, you know, certain places that were lacking ornament. And I remade ornament to situate in these spots. And I was looking at places like blank walls or areas that had been bricked over. <coughs> Specifically areas like the entrance to doorways. And I started recreating uh, these fruit shelves, as I called them. They were based on what in stock ornament is called a fruit bar, and they're actually bar the, these bars of fruit that would go around the doorway. And this fruit was meant to symbolize bounty, excess, abundance, things like this. So I started making my ver own versions of them as these kind of display shelves that were made in cast acrylic. So that from a certain vantage point, the work glistened almost like glass. And then from another vantage point, it completely just disappeared. Like if the sun hit it in a certain way and you were at the right angle, you would never see it. And the organization that commissioned it, they knew what it was about and they knew what I was going to do. But when it came time to install it, they wanted to make banners to hang around the town. And I fought with them over it and said, no, you can't. Like that's not going to happen. And they said, well, we'll make maps. And I said, no, but the whole point is I don't want people to know it's there. And then, you know, I realized we had this kind of collision of, you know, they were paying for it, and I was the guy who didn't want anybody to know it existed. And we agreed on a compromise, which was a map that I stretched into three segments. I sure nobody would find it. Um, but the idea was that you would walk around this town, and you would, you would see these things, and hopefully then you would see another. And they were placed at such a height that you could touch them. Uh, the fruit was cast in such a way that it almost became kind of erotic in, in the way that it was presented. They, they were these kind of small display moments. Um, and they were very curious. And the people in each town ended up taking this really interesting um, sense of ownership over them. Uh, one town they were loved and kind of written about in a publication. Another town, um, there was an incident where some kids smashed three of them violently with baseball bats. But I thought it was like real, like, that gesture of like actually not just like knocking it off the wall, but literally smashing it with bats. I just thought it was really curious, like that this object elicited that in this kind of odd way. And as a parallel investigation to all these exterior works, I've I've also been ma had made and have consistently made interior work that has been based on facades. And this is a shot in my studio of this large triptych panel that was. Uh, based on all this enlarged fruit. So I spent a number of months enlarging fruit to make it the size that it would be on a building if you removed it and just took it down to ground level. And again, like these things became very kind of erotic and, and odd in scale. 
But I've loved, I really love nothing more than being in the studio. And it's always been a place for me to carefully consider things in what I consider to be a very structured and also a very intentional manner. And for me, the studio is separate from my home. Uh, and, and it's a place where I think as an artist, we can really think about things. And formalism has always been a very large component of my work. And in this regard, the decision to hand model this enlarged fruit was critical, specifically to try to do so in a way to make things look as if they had already existed. So in this piece, which is slightly too large, and the fruit is eclipsed into these panels, this project trace was made, uh, it's all cast plaster and, and this drywall frame. 15 feet long, and it's coated in a pigment that's often used for television and film, and it's meant to be seen at a distance. And I found that by painting objects in it, it became so deep and rich that you could almost fall into it. And it was kind of almost hard to tell what this thing was. And the color, like the fruit, it's kind of gone slightly too far. You know, it's, it's, too, it's too saturated. And this piece, Slice, which was one in a series of small works, acts as a section of something removed from a much larger mass. And its color is really difficult to photograph, and it's somewhere between white and green, uncertain as to which it is. So at the time, I started also to look at design things. Like I was looking at the Prada store and the way that Prada uses a really certain green. It's like very icy, and it has this like kind of incredible desire to it. It's again, it's like not white, it's not green, somewhere right in between. And returning to the fair, so to speak, this piece, which is a seven foot high cast plaster fruit bowl, functions right at the edge of absurdity. And the plaster operates as a blank. And it's in between a model and a final product. And in that sense, I think it becomes this kind of ghostly image of itself. And the work is called Utopia, a model. And it was situated in front of this blue wall that became kind of a blueprint, a map kind of transfer device of re Renaissance painting to create something and imagine shifting it somewhere else. And the work had an insane process involved in it of casting all this fruit, pinning it all together, and, and, and constructing it. And again, in the end, it looked like something that I went to some weird place and purchased. You know, like there was very little sense of my hand that was present in the work. And the goal in it, sort of the strategy, was to make the very thing I had been looking at, but to try to take the thing I had been looking and make an object that hopefully through its absurdity would make someone kind of take that jump or that leap. And though made several years later, this work marker also deals with excess and absurdity of ornament. And there were several hundred cast wax plumb bobs that collectively frame out the image of a chandelier and it hangs one inch from the floor and extends nearly 12 feet to the ceiling. And when the air would hit the room in a certain way, the entire piece had this immobility, like this slightly fluctuate in movement of space. And you know, plumb bobs in construction are these forms that are used, uh, you know, if you're trying to find something that's precise level or, or straight line. And I thought it was, I was curious about this idea of how to take that notion and translate it into making this kind of decadent piece of ornament. I've always had this great love of Martha Stewart living, the magazine. And <clears throat> I had a love of it pre Martha Stewart's trip to prison, which when she went to jail um, for insider trading, the magazine changed like greatly. Prior to that, it was really amazing in how uh, objects were photographed. And within the structure of the magazine, there, there were these sections that I think still exist called Good Things, which was supposed to give access to certain steps taken to the signifiers that were kind of marking the pages and, impl and implied lives of the kind of often absent inhabitants of the magazine. And as I stared at these images and I started thinking about the way that objects were being presented, in this case these uh, tin baking molds, I was also starting to think about the correlation that this has an image to things such as Daniel Burnham's drawings for proposed parks and the way that one started to seem like the other, or the kind of ornateness of the drawing started to be echoed in these objects, and the large scale of the park shrunk down into the image of the drawing seemed to correspond to the way in which these small objects could 
suggested something much larger. And upon closer reading, the magazine seems to not only provide us with this how-to approach to design, but it also mapped out this really complex topography of objects within the home. And tables and shelves became landscape, landscapes of display that were made imaginatively recognizable through this careful lens of photography. I thought that one could begin to imagine the table as something much larger than it really is, and in that sense, capable of being mapped and somehow explored. And objects are being photographed in such a way where they became monumental, you know, from something relatively small to the way it was shot suddenly became epic. And this was a period that every month the magazine came, I had a subscription to it. It was like every month I thought, this is it. Like, whatever this photographer is doing, this is what I want my work to do. And it was kind of absurd. Like, I thought, like, I'm, it's like this magazine was doing everything I wanted my work to do, but it just wasn't yet. And then they began also looking at watercolors that were drafted by Jules Guerin, who was employed as the principal draftsman for the Chicago plan. There's this curious kind of correlation that these things have. And uh, on the right, this was the proposed Civic Center of Chicago, which is often mocked in architecture circles as being the most phallic official building ever created. If you look at the scale of a person to the height of that, it would be ridiculous, right? Which obviously was never built. And on the left, this was a proposed boulevard for Chicago. Or here are these stoneware baking molds from Martha Stewart. And within the Chicago plan, as the, you know, the city burns down and Burnham redesigns it, uh, there was a boulevard system that was laid out. And it was intended to run its course through the city, connecting all the public parks in the city through one continuous network. So if you just stayed on such and such a boulevard, you would pass through every public park that was in the city. And I had driven this route multiple times and had ridden my bike on it and noticed the way that it was quite amazing. Like you would go through these. And other cities have these. You know, they're called the Emerald Necklace in Boston, et cetera. But as I started thinking about the map of the city as projected in the plan, suddenly the city becomes a series of kind of sculptural moments. And it was kind of this, this mode of thinking that led me to um, begin this project that I've called the Decorative City. And in working on it, I proposed the project to go to Kohler Company, which is in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And Kohler is the one of the largest producers of what they call sanitary wear in the United States. So they make toilets and sinks. And they have an amazing residency program where as an artist, you can propose a project and work in the factory for three to six months um, and use only their materials and processes. You're not allowed to bring anything else into the factory. So I made prototypes at home and went to the factory and cast and uh, produced these objects. And in scale, these were fairly sizable. They were kind of in like, like this range, so like three feet. And the residency is incredibly generous. They provide you with housing. They do photo shoots where you have to reenact the process of making art. Um, and the photographer said, go ahead and scrape that. And I said, but I never do that. And he said, they don't make a living doing that. So um, I scraped the top of that object, which is an incredibly embarrassing photograph. Um, and they give you housing, photographic services, a stipend to live on. And then in exchange, you give them, uh, you donate a piece to their collection and a piece to the collection of Kohler Company proper. And it was, it was an astounding experience to go through work. Um, and it was one that really changed my art life. And leading up to the residency, I made a ridiculous number of prototypes at my studio thinking I was going to get to all of them. And in fact, I was not able to get to at least a third of them. But this was the process of uh, mocking something up in foam and by using a wheel and setting up a jig, skin coating it in plaster. And then ultimately taking those objects and making large scale molds for them and casting. <laughs> One of the amazing things about working in a factory like this is that you have unlimited access to resources that alone you probably would never have. I sent a message to the person in the wood shop saying I needed some plywood for a mold, and I was sent back like this super high end grade, like furniture plywood. And I said, But I'm just making a mold. And the guy said, That's all we stock. Like everything was like top 
I also said to them that I needed some plaster to make a mold and I wanted a bag delivered to my studio and like there was this really uncomfortable exchange that wasn't possible and I asked why and finally he said, because they come in two ton super sacks. Like everything was just super cube and scale. And they let you do things as an artist that you have no business or experience doing. So this was like, I'd never made molds this large, I'd never used a hoist. Like after <laughs> taking this picture, it cascaded down like a ship. And it was amazing and, and insane, but incredibly productive eventually uh, after a few months passed. And it was the summer, it's incredibly hot, and my biggest memory is calling a friend and I was basically crying on the phone saying, I just want to go home. Like it was so, un so unpleasant at a certain point. But it really kind of pushed me to my maximum in terms of technical skills and and other things that you have access to the most amazing minds. You know, any mold that doesn't work, you can talk to the head mold makers at a company and they would come down and help troubleshoot uh, if they liked you. And the whole factory worked on this kind of cordial system. If someone liked you, you could get anything done. If you crossed the wrong person, they wouldn't do anything for you. I mean, it was totally based on that system. These are the kilns, and the kilns were uh, 250 feet long, and there were four of them, I believe. This is how they loaded them with a forklift. And um, the kilns were fired all the time, and there was one that would go in at room temperature, come out at top, you know, at, at cool, and in the middle it got to like 112, which is very hot. One of the kilns broke when I was there, and they shut it off, and I asked when the last time that happened was, and they said the kilns had not been shut off in 30 years. Like the gas had run for 30 years. Ah. The rumor of the factory is that if anything fell off the kiln, it had a suit. And they would give somebody a case of beer if they would put the suit on, run in, and grab the object that <laughs> fell off the shelf. And after being there, I kind of believe the story. And what ultimately it made me do, though, is that it made me want to radically change the way that I worked after leaving there. And I made lots of grand proclamations that I would never again work large, I would never again use ceramic. Like, it just pushed me to this point where I thought, I've seen the edge, and I'm ready to back off. Um, but that residency was so critical and also so crushing for me because what happened was I left the residency with a bunch of really shiny, beautiful objects, and as far as I was concerned, it was a complete failure. Like, none of them did anything that I wanted. I just had a lot of really shiny objects shipped back to me. And I'll pick up on where that went. But residencies have always served a really important function for me. These are images of the Watershed Center for Ceramics where I've worked on a number of occasions a very different kind of a facility. It's basically an old brick factory that's falling apart. It couldn't be any more different from Kohler. But the thing that I love about residencies is it gives me a chance to leave my home and leave my studio and leave the conventions I'm used to and in a very short amount of time sketch something out. So this was two weeks of working and then when I left I just trashed all the work and went home and took some photographs. And that set me up for the next so for me, I've kind of come up with these systems that allow me to have a productive way of working. And it took a while after the experience of being at Kohler to figure out what to do with all this work and ultimately to figure out what I wanted my work to really do. And the current work now is under this working title, The Decorative City, and ultimately deals with systems of mapping and also with visual correlation between decorative objects such as baking molds and actual structures that this is a piece called Sprawl. And I find that my method of working at this point is, you know, the work is intentionally trying to reference things such as utopian systems, uh, systems that are closed. And, and also making work that uh, has a certain aesthetic of, of communicating things such as architectural models and also things that are what I have considered to be propositional. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a couple of minutes. And I, I go to great lengths in the work to be really intentional of what I do. I either want things to be incredibly cold and, and appear fabricated and untouched, and I want other, other times the work to seem you know, as if it was very crudely made. And ultimately, aside from the kind of conceptual framework, these ideas are really concerned with the issue of, of making sculpture. And for me, what I mean by this is it's thinking about things that, that are both articulate and the idea of making something that's inarticulate and the ability that an object has to vacillate between these two points. 
color has been uh, something that's really critical to me as, as a, a, a vehicle to make something appear, um, again, kind of incredibly saturated as if this, this mound of extrusions is literally made of solid color. Or in other works, uh, to divorce color from it entirely, so that the piece reads as this kind of blank model. And lately, and this is leading up to the last group of images, I, I've been obsessed with the work of Anthony Caro, which sometimes can feel like a dangerous thing to say. Um, and of his work, I'm most interested in two pieces, and these are the two. Both are made in the mid-60s when Caro was living and working in Bennington, Vermont, which was a shift from his native home in England. And at the time, Caro was living in the same town as Jules Alnitsky, Ken Nolan, and Helen Frankenthaler, all of whom went on to become and were at the time these giants of high modernism. And at the time as well, Clement Greenberg, the critic, was making frequent trips to the area and used uh, Caro's work and that of a few others as the basis for his essay towards the new sculpture. It was also at this time that Michael Fried began to publish and Fried had a long relationship with Caro by championing his work and later that of the minimalists and arguing for the role and possibility of the autonomous art object and its relationship with the viewer and surrounding architecture. And this was a fertile time, albeit highly problematic in theoretical terms. And in some ways, I think we can see this as one of the ends of modernism. And it was this critical juncture for how sculpture was being thought about and the resulting series of successions and movements that have led the way to how we now understand the activity. So in some ways, I think it could be kind of world's fair of modernity, which is a sweeping generalization. But for me, these works have an amazing sculptural logic and they're in that they're completely self-referential and they're a literal closed system. And in this regard, they operate in a similar manner to the sort of utopian projects that I spoke of earlier. And from a good portion of maybe two years, I was trying to figure out why this work, what this work did that I thought was so significant in relation to the things that I was interested in. And it was a moment of really understanding that closed system that modernist sculpture has that I began to think about it in regards to these kind of utopian uh, communities and projects that I had looked at so much. Because ultimately they're all destined for some kind of theoretical failure of some sort, though they're also nearly impenetrable in their potential. Like this work is, is undeniable in what it is, yet again, it's kind of flawed. So I'm no longer concerned with making installations or environments in which one becomes implicitly involved in something experiential. Rather, I'm attempting to establish a distance between the work and the world. And there needs to be a sculptural logic that permits the work from being different from the space and objects that we react, interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. And for me, that's exactly what makes it function in one manner is sculpture. This is a work called Prospect. And this work and, and the resulting images are, are ways that I'm also trying to think of this idea of art and sculpture, my own in particular, and the role that objects can have in, in, in denoting this kind of propositional object or something being a prototype and model. And that the notion of a model can have great kind of power in, in what it could be, but necessarily it's almost very important. So right now what I'm thinking about most is the trope of beauty and the way that beauty has functioned in much of my work until now. And I began to question that and kind of have some suspicion of it. And the question I'm left with now is how could the sculpturally awkward function in the same way that the beautiful has functioned? I think at times part of this comes from having children and watching very young children be really awkward when they're old enough to have a certain kind of self-identity but also not to really control it socially. And there's this great way that children will be really uncomfortable and awkward. And there's something like beautiful and painful about watching that. And, and I often think, if I could make my work do that, that would kind of get to where I want this to be. 
And in thinking about this modernist sculpture, I'm not trying to mimic it, but rather I'm trying to rethink it and trying to kind of find those moments and think about how I can bring out this kind of awkwardness as a way of distinguishing the work from other things. This is a sketch. Uh, I'd gone back to the watershed with Brian a couple summers ago, and in two weeks I made four objects, which for me was incredibly slow. But I wanted to think really carefully about this notion of sort of awkward. And this is the last project in the most recent work, which uh, last March I was invited to take part in this exhibition at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It was called Interactions in Clay. And they selected four people, uh, myself, Ann A.G., Walter McConnell, and Betty Woodman. And we were asked to make a proposal to design a work that responded to the museum, to one particular room within the museum. And we were supposed to make a new work that would respond to the collection. They didn't offer to fly us out for that, so I did it from a map on the computer, which was a really curious way to go about it. And I think ultimately I made a good choice. But, um, and I, I made this piece, which is called Towards Models Monument. Towards Models, <laughs> forgetting the name of it now. Propositions of some possible systems. And this is an installation in the Brazilian. And the work was housed in the uh, Pennsylvania German collection which was full of all of this furniture that had been made right in the region around the same time um, that Philadelphia was being founded, historically. And so I, I made this work where ornament began to kind of interweave with the objects in the collection, and also this series of tableaus where the, these tabletops became these, these uh, kind of models of sorts that collided things that were incredibly carefully made with objects that were very kind of awkwardly and every object in this collection of the museum is incredibly touched and handmade. So I was also contrasting certain work that had been generated through rapid prototyping and computer milling with things that I had, had made in this very kind of rough way. And ultimately looking at the way in which these things had an ability to respond to the collection and present something that was uh, very different and, and kind of awkward from the things that were present there. So that's the last image. Thank you. That went a bit over.